With an understanding of the history and evolution of American advertising, it's now time to consider persuasive techniques in contemporary advertising, commercial speech and regulating advertising, and the role of advertising in a democratic society. Advertising, at its very core, is persuasion. It's a company persuading a consumer to try its product or service, either for the first time or to choose it over its competitor. Advertising employs a wide range of persuasive techniques and strategies. One of the most recognizable is the famous person testimonial, where a product is endorsed by a well-known person, like NBA player LeBron James's endorsement of Sprite. The beverage even released a special LeBron's version of the lemon lime soda with added cherry and orange flavors. I especially enjoy the animated ads for Sprite Cranberry that air around the Christmas holiday. Another persuasive technique is the plain folks pitch, where a product is associated with simplicity. The spokesperson is just a regular, plain folk, pitching a practical product for ordinary people. State Farms, like a good neighbor slogan, is a good example of the plain folks pitch. A third persuasive technique is snob appeal, an attempt to persuade consumers that using a specific product or service will maintain or elevate their social status. Luxury automobiles, perfume, clothing, and jewelry make use of the snob appeal. BMW's slogan, the ultimate driving machine, is an example of this technique. The idea is you get what you pay for, and expensive things are better than cheaper alternatives. A Kia might get you where you need to go, but it's far from the ultimate driving machine. The opposite of snob appeal is the bandwagon effect, in which an ad claims everyone is using a product or service, and if you don't, then you're missing out. Bandwagon brands use phrases like America's favorite and the best selling. Fast food restaurant McDonald's employs the bandwagon effect by noting billions and billions served on its iconic golden arches. An ad campaign using hidden fear appeal plays on consumers' insecurity. Personal hygiene products like deodorant, mouthwash, and shampoo often use this technique, including dial soap. Their aren't you glad you use dial soap slogan? Let consumers know that while other people may have a not so fresh odor, you're using the number one antibacterial soap, so you know you smell clean. A final persuasive technique is irritation advertising, in which an ad creates product name recognition by being annoying or obnoxious, like the uber annoying jingle for webuyanycar.com. Another persuasive technique used by ad agencies is the association technique, aligning a product or service with a cultural value or image that has a positive connotation, even if it has little connection to the actual product. Blue jean manufacturer Levi Strauss has long associated itself with patriotism and has been named among the top five most patriotic brands. Levi's 2018 Use Your Vote TV commercial, which featured voting rituals from around the world, was a bronze winner in the annual Clio Advertising Awards. Some companies use the association principle to claim their products are real or natural, like Coke's use of the slogan, the real thing. Others use the label green to associate a product with being environmentally friendly, even if it isn't. Another problematic use of the association principle is to link products with exaggerated stereotypes like appealing to women by portraying men as idiots who are clueless about basic household chores like cooking and laundry. The idea is that women will view the ads and feel better about themselves and their ability to maintain a household and thus want to purchase the advertised product or service. Some advertising tells a story using elements commonly found in myths. An ad may mimic a mini drama or sitcom complete with characters, setting, and a plot. Characters experience conflict, which is resolved when using the advertised product saves the day. In just one example, from a 2010 Super Bowl commercial, commercial, Betty White is playing a football game. 
After being teased by her teammates for her poor performance, Betty's girlfriend rushes onto the field, urging her to eat a Snickers. Betty takes a bite and immediately transforms because you're not you when you're hungry. Sometimes ads are inserted into the media itself through product placement, strategically placing ads or buying space in movies, TV shows, comic books, or video games. So they appear as part of the story's environment. Some examples include use of Microsoft products like a Windows phone, Surface Pro computer, and even the Bing search engine in the 2017 film Get Out and field trips to Subway on the TV series The Biggest Loser. In 2005, the watchdog organization Commercial Alert asked both the Federal Trade Commission and the Federal Communications Commission to mandate notices about product placement in TV programming. The FTC rejected the petition, and the FCC just never responded. Advertising is considered commercial speech, defined as any print or broadcast expression for which a fee is charged to the organization or individual buying time or space in the mass medium. While the First Amendment protects freedom of speech and the press, it's not clear on whether advertisers can say anything they want in commercial speech. Critics feel some forms of advertising can have negative consequences and should be regulated. So-called destructive ads include those targeting children, ads for unhealthy products like alcohol and tobacco, ones that encourage dangerous behavior such as extreme weight loss through starvation, and ads marketing prescription medication directly to consumers. For years, groups like Action for Children's Television worked to limit advertising aimed at children. Congress was hesitant to question the unclear protections of commercial speech under the First Amendment and pressured by ad industry lobbyists. Ultimately, Congress passed the Children's Television Act of 1990. Our textbook claims it has done little to restrict advertising aimed at children, but that's not entirely true. The act did make changes, although their impact is debatable. First, the act limited the amount of commercial time that could be aired during children's television programming, defined as a show created for an audience of 12 and younger. The limits are 10.5 minutes per hour on weekends and 12 minutes per hour on weekdays. While there is some discrepancy as to the current average ratio of ads to programming, it's common for an hour of television to contain up to 16 minutes of ads. Thanks to the Children's Televisions Act of 1990, children are seeing four or more fewer minutes of advertising per hour. Second, as research showed younger viewers had difficulty distinguishing between programming and commercials, networks created bumpers to more clearly separate the two. Perhaps the most famous example is the bumps used by Cartoon Network during its Adult Swim programming block. But when I think of bumpers, my mind immediately goes to this gem from ABC, featuring three claymation dancers letting me know, after these messages, we'll be right back. Third, the act prohibiting prohibited in-program ads, which means you would no longer see an ad selling My Little Pony or G.I. Joe during one of their programs. Finally, the Children's Television Act of 1990 required networks to provide educational and informational children's programming. This didn't work out too well, though, as there were no actual length requirements, and some stations labeled shows like The Jetsons educational because it teaches children what life will be like in the 21st century. Let's look at some of the ad categories deemed problematic. Critics have long accused advertising of contributing to eating disorders and negative body image among girls and women. Fashion and cosmetic, among other industries, often use ultra thin female models to market their products. Such a high standard of beauty can be difficult to attain triggering anorexia and other eating disorders. At the same time, advertising has been blamed for the tripling of American obesity rates since the 1980s. The food and restaurant industry denies the connection. I also think it's a bit of a stretch to blame advertising 
without considering the changing dynamic of the American family. With previously stay-at-home parents entering the workforce and increasing divorce rates, creating more single-parent households. Another problem area is tobacco consumption. Tobacco ads disappeared from television in 1971 under pressure from Congress and the FCC, but they still show up in plenty of other media trying to recruit new customers. Legal settlements, settlements between states and the tobacco industry have helped limit direct marketing to teenagers by banning use of cartoon characters in ads like the famous Joe Camel. Companies also can't advertise on billboards or in subway and commuter trains because of their availability to young people. Even so, tobacco companies still spend $9.5 billion annually on U.S. advertisements, more than 20 times what is spent on anti-tobacco public service spots. Many of the same complaints fielded by tobacco companies are also directed at alcohol advertising. College students are a natural target market for beer and alcohol ads, but many traditional aged college students are still underage. One of the most popular beer campaigns of the 1990s featured a trio of frogs croaking Bud Wise Er, applying the same tactics as Joe Camel, cartoon like animals to appeal to younger audiences. Perhaps more unsettling is a 2012 report from Johns Hopkins University that showed black Americans 12 to 20 times more likely than their non-black peers to be exposed to beer and alcohol advertising. While there is some correlation to higher media consumption rates among black youth, alcohol ads were being placed in media with larger black audiences, such as BET television and magazines like Jet, Essence, and Ebony. A final issue surrounding advertising is pharmaceutical companies marketing directly to consumers rather than doctors. In 1994, companies were spending $266 million on direct-to-consumer advertising for prescription drugs. By 2017, it was $5.8 billion. A survey found that nearly one in three adults has talked to a doctor about a particular drug after seeing an ad for it on TV, and one in eight subsequently received a prescription, creating consumer demand for a particular treatment that might not be the best option for the patient. Brief TV ads can't effectively communicate everything consum consumers need to know about a medication. So who is watching the advertising industry? Ultimately, it's the role of the Federal Trade Commission and other government agencies to monitor false and deceptive advertising and the excess of commercialism. Through its truth in advertising rules, the FTC plays an investigative role in substantiating claims of various advertisers. A certain amount of puffery is allowed, that is, ads featuring hyperbole or exaggeration. But the FTC defines ads as deceptive when they are likely to mislead reasonable consumers through the statements made, images shown, or the information omitted. One example, is in the early 1970s when Ocean Spray claimed its cranberry juice cocktail had more food energy than orange juice or tomato juice. As the New York Times reported, the claim made it sound like the drink had more vitamins and minerals than its competitors. It did not. But it did have more of the literal definition of food energy, calories. The FTC ordered Ocean Spray to run a year's worth of corrective advertising to clarify their original claim. The FTC can also require advertisers to change ads or remove them from circulation and impose monetary civil penalties to be paid to consumers. Beyond the FTC, a few nonprofit watchdog and advocacy organizations exist. One is Commercial Alert founded in 1998 in part with help from longtime consumer advocate Ralph Nader. The group seeks to limit excessive commercialism in society by challenging marketing tactics that allow corporate intrusion into civic life. Some examples include imposing ads disguised as regular posts on Instagram and keeping hospital obstetric wards free of ads for infant formula and other products. Another group is the Truth Initiative, 
which launched its first anti-smoking and anti-tobacco industry ad campaign in the year 2000. Along with its prevalent TV ads, the Truth Campaign reaches out to teens online and through a grassroots approach with summer tours and events. Finally, a major way advertising interacts with our democratic society is through political ads. Commercials sell candidates to the electorate, promoting a candidate's image and persuading the public to adopt a particular viewpoint. While a bulk of spending is done on television, political ads are found everywhere else ads are, including radio, newspapers, and mobile games. What can easily be considered excessive ad budgets for campaigns means less affluent, often third-party candidates, can't compete. The internet has helped level the playing field somewhat, as compelling content has the potential to go viral, regardless of who originally paid to create it. Despite concerns about advertising's potential negative impact on our democracy, it maintains a hold on American culture. Without advertising, many mass media industries, television, the internet, movies, would have to entirely reinvent their business models, as newspapers and magazines are doing right now, through instituting paywalls or asking for reader donations in the face of losing so much of their ad revenue over the last decade.